Many men will drink the rain and turn to think the clouds. Many men will hear you speak, they will never turn around. But I will not forget you, I might got my king, the thankful heart I in my operation sacrifices and what you can give but what I alone can give to you grateful heart I give a thankful prayer I pray a wild dance I dance before you a loud song I sing a huge bell I ring a life of praise Many men will pour their gold and serve a thing that shines. Many men will read your words and will never change their minds. But I will not forget you, I my God, my King, with a thankful heart I in my offering. Sacrifices, not what you can give, but what I alone can give to you. Grateful heart I give, and thankful prayer I pray. A wild dance I dance before you. A loud song I sing, a huge bell I ring, a life of praise. I will not forget you, oh my God, my King. With a thankful heart, I bring my offering and my sacrifices. Now what you can give, but what I don't can give to you. Grateful heart, I give. Thankful prayer, I pray. Wild dance. In your arms, I will 
Dear Jesus, we thank you for this night. Lord, we thank you for your word. And God, we do thank you that the battle is yours, that whatever we're facing, we can trust you with it, that we know that you work all things for our good, and we don't have to struggle on our own. We can surrender everything to you and trust that you have it all under control. And Lord, I ask that we would just take our hands off and let you lead us and truly be the Lord of our life. Have your way in us and in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Whitney, and welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. Um, next Sunday, or, or this Sunday coming up, is first Sunday of the month, and that means communion. So make sure you have your grape juice and your cracker or matzah and uh, let's do communion together apart. So uh, with that, pull out your friend to friend card and let's pray for our friends and pray for ourselves as we open up God's word this evening. Father, thank you for the people that you've placed on our hearts to pray for. We lift them up to you right now. And we ask that you would just pour out your grace and your mercy and your compassion on them. Lord, send people into their lives that can affect them. Do whatever it takes, Lord. You know better than we do. I could give you specifics and they could be wrong. So Lord, just do whatever it takes to bring our friends and our family members into your kingdom so that we can all spend eternity together. And if you'd like to use us, Lord, we're available. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. <coughs> we ask that as we open it up tonight, that you'd help us to open up our hearts to what your Holy Spirit might want to say to us. That we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but Lord, that we would be doers of your word. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. We're going to read the whole chapter, then we're going to read the whole chapter 9 as well. It's not as long as you think it might be. <coughs> but it's all the same story, so you kind of have to have to do that. Uh, and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, <coughs> He didn't say a cough. Go into Pharaoh and tell him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go, then I will plague all your territory with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs. They will come up and go into your palace, into your bedroom, and on your bed, into the houses of your officials and your people, and into your ovens and kneading bowls. The frogs will come up on you, your people, and all your officials being pretty explicit there. Frogs are going to be everywhere. They're going to be sick of frogs. Got that. The Lord then said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with, <coughs> with your staff over the rivers, canals, and ponds, and cause the frogs to come up onto the land of Egypt. When Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same thing by their occult practices and brought frogs up onto the land of Egypt. <coughs> Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Appeal to the Lord to remove the frogs. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having a hard time. To remove the frogs from me and my people, then I will let the people go and they can sacrifice to the Lord. 
Moses said to Pharaoh, You may have the honor of choosing. When should I appeal on behalf of you, your officials, and the people, that the frogs be taken away from you and your houses and remain only in the Nile? Tomorrow, he answered. Moses replied, As you have said, So let it be written, so let it be done. Oh, that was the other guy. Sorry. Um, As you have said, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God, the frogs will go away from you, your houses, your officials, and your people. The frogs will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord for help concerning the frogs that he had brought against Pharaoh. The Lord did as Pharaoh had said. Excuse me, the Lord did as Moses had said. I used to know how to read, I really did. The frogs in the house, courtyard, and fields died. They piled them in countless heaps, and there was a terrible odor in the land. But when Pharaoh saw there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First, uh, the magicians, with their counterfeit, did a counterfeit miracle that was similar to Moses and Aaron, or to God's miracle, actually. And then the thing is, every time I read these, I'm like, well, they already had frogs everywhere. How, how, how did the magicians do that? But, you know, I don't know. But uh, they, or, or maybe they told Pharaoh, we can do the same thing. That's no big deal. Uh, and at any rate, the magicians, you know, did a counterfeit of what God was doing. But I want you to notice, who did Pharaoh ask when it was time to get rid of the frogs? If the magicians were so great, why didn't they tell the frogs to go away? Because they couldn't. They, they were no match for the power of God. And you see that all through this. So let's see what else happens here. Uh, then the Lord said to Pharaoh, excuse me, I keep calling Moses Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses, Hey, Mo, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the land and it will become gnats throughout the land of Egypt. And they did this. Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff, and when he struck the dust of the land, gnats were on people and animals. All the dust of the land became gnats throughout the land of Egypt. And if you've seen pictures of Egypt, it's pretty much all dust, right? The magicians tried to produce gnats using their occult practices, but they could not. The gnats remained on the people and animals. This is the finger of God, the magician said to Pharaoh. Duh. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. The Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. When you see him going out to the water, tell him this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you will not let my people go, then I will send swarms of flies against you, your officials, your people, and your houses. The Egyptians' houses will swarm with flies, and so will the land where they live. But on that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen, where my people are living. No flies will be there. This way you will know that I, the Lord, am in the land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will take place tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Thick swarms of flies went into Pharaoh's palace and his officials' houses. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined because of the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the country. But Moses said it would not be right to do that because (coughs) what we will sacrifice to the Lord our God is detestable to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what the Egyptians detest in front of them, 
Won't they stone us? We must go a distance of three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he instructs us. Pharaoh responded, I will let you go and sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but don't go very far. Make an appeal for me. As soon as I leave you, Moses said, I will appeal to the Lord. And tomorrow the swarms of flies will depart from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. But Pharaoh must not act deceptively again by refusing to let the people go and sacrifice to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh's presence and appealed to the Lord. The Lord did as Moses had said. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. Not one was left. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Stop there for a second. I'm about to start a new chapter anyway. But I want you to notice that God's in control of nature. God's in control of the animals. Nobody else is. And the other thing I want you to notice, God protects his people. God is in control when bad things in the world start to happen. God is in control. He can take care of you. And he can take care of me. Right now, even though people are trying to make us scared of all sorts of things, God's still in control. Do you believe that? I do. Let's keep on. 9 verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go and keep holding them, then the Lord's hand will bring a severe plague against your livestock in the field, the horses, donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all the Israelites' own will die. And the Lord... Excuse me. And the Lord set a time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. The Lord did this thing the next day. All the Egyptian livestock died, but none among the Israelite livestock died. See how God can can do what he wants. And God can manage even bad times, just like he's doing today. Seventh verse, Pharaoh sent messengers who saw that not one single Excuse me, not a single one of the Israelite livestock was dead. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of furnace soot, and Moses is to throw it toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the entire land of Egypt. It will become festering boils on people and animals throughout the land of Egypt. So they have a whole nation of Jobs. So they took furnace soot and stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw it toward heaven, and it became festering boils on the people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on the Egyptians. Yeah, because they were nothing. They were frauds, but Moses had the real God of of the heavens on his side, or Moses was on God's side. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had told Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. For this time I am about to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know there is no one like me on the whole earth. But now I, by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known on the whole earth. You are still acting arrogantly against my people by not letting them go. Tomorrow at this time, I will rain down the worst hail 
that has ever occurred in Egypt, from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, give orders to bring your livestock and all that you have in the field into shelters. So every person and animal that is in the field and not brought inside will die when the hail falls on them. Those among Pharaoh's officials who feared the word of the Lord made their servants and livestock flee to shelters. They were smart. But those who didn't take heart, the Lord's take to heart the Lord's word, left their servants and livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven and let there be hail throughout the land of Egypt. Oh, hail. On people and animals and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his hand, his staff, excuse me, toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail. Lightning struck the land, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. The hail with lightning flashing through it was so severe that nothing like it had occurred in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hail struck down everything in the field, both people and animals. The hail beat down every plant of the field and shattered every tree in the field. The only place it didn't hail was in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, I have sinned this time, he said. Excuse me, he said to them, the Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the guilty ones. Make an appeal to the Lord. There has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. Moses said to him, when I have left the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But as for you and your officials, I know that you still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was ripe and the flax was budding. But the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed since they are later crops. Moses left Pharaoh and the city and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail ceased and the rain no longer poured down on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his officials. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not let the Israelites go, as the Lord had said through Moses. So, this is sort of an interesting picture that we get. It's really uh, a picture of life. No, God's not raining hail down on you and causing swarms of flies and all that kind of stuff. But we have a choice, just like Pharaoh has. See, from the very first, when Moses went in and said, hey, God wants us to go out and make a sacrifice in the desert, you need to let us go. Pharaoh had a choice. He could say, okay, and let his workforce go. Or he could harden his heart against God and not let the people go. We don't, sometimes we, we forget that he has that choice. Every single time. The whole reason that Moses goes to Pharaoh to tell him what's about to happen is because God is warning Pharaoh. God has warned us. Are we listening? See, that there are consequences to the way we live this life, but are we listening? At the end of everything, you and I, everybody is going to be judged one way or the other. Our sister in the Lord, our church, mate, our keyboardist, sissy, has gone to be with the Lord. And she's already heard that judgment on her. 
She's already heard those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And, and by the way, if you'd like to attend her funeral service, we're going to celebrate her life at Restland at 10 in the morning on Friday. And at... I said Restland. Graveside. Oh, sorry. The wife wanted to butt in. It's a graveside service only, so... There's some chances of rain, so bring your umbrella uh, just in case it's raining. But uh, there's also a visitation on Thursday. Uh, look up the times and stuff at restland.com for the times of her, view, her uh, visitation. Anyway, she's, she's received her judgment. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in, right? And everybody in heaven is rejoicing and welcoming Sissy in, and she's getting to see all the things that we want to see eventually. We're going to miss her, but she's not missing us one bit. <laughs> but the, the thing is, we have a choice. Pharaoh had a choice. Do what God says, and none of these bad things are going to happen. See, God's a good parent. That's what we should do with our children. With our children, with, with Whitney all the time, she knew what the consequences were going to be, if she did not behave in whatever way we were telling her. And so she thought it over. And most, most of the time, she thought, you know what? I'd rather do what dad's asking me to do than have to deal with the consequences. See, Pharaoh was not that smart. I think Pharaoh had a little bit of a God complex himself. So he's, who is this? Remember when Moses first approached him? Who is this God anyway? <laughs> well, you're finding out now, bud. But see, we have a choice too, to follow God's instructions or not to follow him. Every one of us is going to be judged. Every one out of one person's passes from this life to the next. And we will all stand before God. Some of us will hear what sissies heard. Well done, good and faithful servant. There are other people that won't. It says in Hebrews 9, 27, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. And see, God's really the only person who can fairly judge us. He's the only one who knows what's in our mind when we're doing things. How many of you can say that you have done the right thing for the wrong reason sometimes? Can I see your hand? No, I can't see your hand because you're there and I'm here. But see, we all choose how we're going to respond to God, just like Pharaoh did. And sometimes we say that we will and just act like Pharaoh. See, Pharaoh, a couple times here, Pharaoh said, okay, go. But then he didn't let him go, right? Have you done that? Have you been that person that God says, whom shall I send and who will go? And you say, here am I, Lord, send me, but then you don't go? Well, sometimes we go back on our words. Look at what happened to Pharaoh when he went back on his words. See, judgment for the non-believer, for those who don't follow Jesus, is not such a good thing. I've done funerals for non-believers before, and I want to tell you, those are some of the most saddest events you will ever attend. Why? There's no hope. See, every one of us, we have the hope of our salvation, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're going to see sissy again one day. Doesn't, it doesn't make us not miss her now, but what it does is it gives us that, that hope that we're going to be reunited. And I'm going to be reunited with several relatives and friends that have, that have gone ahead. You know, the thing that I don't like about getting older is that the people that you, that you know and like die. That's just part of life. But the good part of that is that we who know Jesus 
are going to go be with Jesus and we'll all be reunited again. For non-believers, there is no good part. Their good part <coughs> is living right now. How many of you would think this would be, you know, if, 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 if this is all that life is, that that would just be okay with you? Do you want this to just be all it is? Do you want this to just be all that there is? I don't. I'm looking forward to heaven. Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15 says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and small standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the book. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And I just have to ask you one question. Are they going to find your name in that book when they open it up at the great white throne judgment? Because all the people that their name was not in that book they're getting thrown into the lake of fire, which is what we all, we all think Satan's there now. No, he doesn't go there. He's not there now. He's roaming throughout the earth and the heavenlies and all that. And you can read some of that at the first chapter of Job. But they're being thrown into the lake of fire during the white throne judgment. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want any part of being thrown into the lake of fire. I don't want to have to learn how to ski on asbestos skis. I, I, don't, I don't want any of that. But my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. How, how do I know that? Because I have received what Jesus died to give me. And that is eternal life. And that, at the white throne judgment, is where believers get to receive that which Jesus died for us. We get to receive that, that eternal life. We, you know, really, we started that eternal life. Sorry, I'm, 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 I think I had a mosquito earlier. Um, but we had all that, you know, we, we start eternal life the moment that we surrender our lives to Jesus. But we actually get to, you know, physically see it happen at this white throne judgment. Aren't you anticipating that? Isn't that, a, isn't that going to be a great day? Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, in other words, you know, just like Pharaoh, God, God's going to point out what he wants us to do in this life. And the nice thing is, when you surrender to Jesus, he's not just going to point out what you need to do. He's going to help us do it. So we, we just make that choice. Am I going to do what God wants me to do or not? It says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? This is telling us right here, signs and wonders are not the sign of a mature Christian. The fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, God does signs and wonders, but the fruit of the Spirit, God's character, mainly his character of love. They will know that you're my disciples because you love one another. That's the sign. It says, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. That's going to be a terrible day for some people. That's those people 
who think that we have forever on this planet. We don't. We don't have forever on this planet. Whether the rapture comes or not, the Lord could come for us at any time. Because all of us are going to step into eternity, either the natural way, natural way like Sissy just did, or the rapture is going to come and take us in a supernatural way. But either way, Jesus is coming soon. And in this, in this passage that we just read, the Jews were the ones, they're the picture of us now, we who are following God. And the Jews in this passage were protected because they followed what God said. See, the judgment for the believer, the judgment seat of Christ, that's where we actually receive rewards. See, this white throne judgment for a believer is just sort of a check-in. Do you have a reservation? Let me see, a car, car. Okay, I see, yeah, you and your whole family, okay. Uh, come on in. I see you got a couple of Douglases in your family too. Okay, come on in. But, that, and, you know, and, and so we, get, we check in at the white throne judgment. And some people check out at the white throne judgment. But at the judgment seat of Christ, we receive our rewards or we find out that we just made it by the skin of our teeth. If you have skin on your teeth, you might be a redneck. <laughs> you know, so at the, that's, where we, that's where we receive our rewards and we're going to receive those and we're going to realize, you know, I don't really deserve this. Right? Because we're going to know who actually did it, and it was Jesus. You know, I, I don't have any, any right for anybody to pat me on the back for anything. Every good thing in my life is because of Jesus being in my life. Period. And we're going to know that when we stand at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. We are. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. That's where you and I are going to get crowns that we don't deserve. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be re revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss but he himself will be saved, but only by the skin of his teeth. But only as one, <coughs> excuse me, but only as through the fire. So we're going to be tested by fire. Well, what, what is that fire thing? Um, we're going to be tested by the trials and difficulties that happen in this life. Just like, <coughs> you know, the Jewish people, they went through a couple of those, you know, the the water turned to blood and all the land. And I think the, the thing with the gnats, you know, they didn't distinguish w with that one uh, or the frogs. I'm not sure which one. They, but they, God started distinguishing, you know, I think one of the angels, oh, you forgot something, you know. Because God protects his, his people. And we just need to make sure that we're building on the right foundation with stuff that matters. See, we start getting caught up in, in all the things of the world that really don't matter for eternity. They matter to worldly people, but not so much to God because our residence 
our residency, you know, here on the planet, it might say the United States of America, but our real home is heaven. And we need to be doing things. How how to build with gold, uh, silver, and costly stones is, is to build the kingdom of God while you're here. I just had another friend pass away yesterday, a couple days ago. And his name's Terry Law. And he founded a ministry that I, that uh, sent out one of the bands that I was in and where I met Evelyn called Living Sound. And this man is a true evangelist winning literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people to, to the Lord. He built with gold, silver, and costly stone. I guarantee you what he was building will not burn up in the fire. He's heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. He's going to be missed by a lot of people. He had a absolute effect in my life as I was growing up and when I was traveling with Living Sound. You couldn't be around that guy without hearing about Jesus and without hearing about the next campaign where he was going to go win people for the Lord. He's an amazing man. Glad that I got to know him. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 and 28 says, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See, Jesus is coming back. And that's when we will be able to actually have the salvation that we're waiting for. Oh, yeah, we we say I'm saved. That's because you know that you're going to go to heaven, but you haven't gone there yet, right? That's why Christ in us is the hope of glory. See, we're still living down here. But we have the hope of new life in Christ. See, Jesus has already taken all the punishment for those who remain in Christ. He's already taken all the punishment that you'll ever have. We might still have to go through difficulties, but, and, 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 and God says to Pharaoh that he's going to show the, he's going to do these things to show Pharaoh how powerful he is And to hopefully change Pharaoh from an arrogant guy to a guy who can bow his knee to Jesus. See, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're all going to bow anyway. Maybe we should do that while we're here. Because if we don't, that picture of the lake of fire isn't a really nice picture. And it's real. So just like Pharaoh, God's always waiting for us to turn and follow him with our whole heart. See, he's not going to reject us. He wouldn't have rejected Pharaoh if he had bowed his knee to the Lord when when God first confronted him. Or maybe after the first one or two plagues. But Pharaoh didn't do that. See, we just need to turn to to Jesus before it's too late. Pharaoh waited until his firstborn was dead. Now, do you think that he waited too long? Do you think he waited too long? Well, yeah. We have to make sure that we don't wait too long. You won't be holding your firstborn in your hand. You'll be, "Uh uh-oh, I don't have any any fire-retardant clothes. 
See, we need to make sure that we turn to Jesus before it's too late. Pharaoh didn't do that. Pharaoh waited until his kid was dead. I don't, I don't want anything like that to happen in my life. Especially I don't want my daughter to die. But we just need to follow, turn to Jesus with our whole heart. You'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's what God tells us in the book of Jeremiah. Ezekiel 33, 11. Tell them as I live, this is the Lord, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his way and live. Repent, repent of your evil ways. Why will you die, house of Israel? See, God says right there, he doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Then why is it that wicked people are always telling everybody that, you know, God hates them? God doesn't hate anyone. He wants people to turn away from their own way and follow his way. The problem with people is they want to be able to decide what the rules are. See, we don't get that place. God created this place. And wouldn't you think that the person who created something should be able to create the rules? I do. I have no problem with God's rules. Do you? I have no problem with anything the Lord has ever told me to do. It's always been right. 2 Samuel 14, 14. We will certainly die and be like water poured out on the ground, which can't be recovered. But God would not take away a life. He would devise plans so that the one banished from him does not remain Banished. See, God's, God doesn't hate those people that are out there who are running away from him. He doesn't like what they're doing. He might hate what they're doing, but he loves them. And what does he want them to do? The word repent means change your mind. That's what God wants. God wants us to change our mind about following him. God wanted Pharaoh to change his mind about doing what God was telling him to do. That's the same for you and me. And there was one day that I changed my mind. I repented. And I started following Jesus. Doesn't mean that I became perfect. God had to work on me. There were still rough areas in my life. How about you? And that, you know, my life has been a continual pattern of repentance ever since I came to Jesus because you know what I've had to change my mind about a lot of things that I used to do there are a lot of things that I did and I thought it was right and I found out that it was wrong and I had to change my mind and decide to agree with God uh, is it the same thing with you see God's not going to turn us away if we do that there is one prayer that God will always hear that's what, and, and it's whether you're a Christian or it's whether you're a non-believer, it doesn't matter. God will always hear this prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. When we repent of our sin, we change our mind about our sin in such a way that we want to get out of doing our sin, God hears it, and he has mercy, and he forgives. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 12 says, For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Uh, in, in another translation, it says, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. But this is good too. Twelfth verse, you will call to me and come and pray to me, 
and I will listen to you. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. What he means by that was when people would repent, and a lot of people repent in word only, don't they? Yeah. And, and here, in, in, in the days of Joel, people would repent vocally, but they would also do something. They would tear their clothes. When they, that was a sign that they had been repenting, right? And God's saying, tear your heart, not your clothes. In other words, do something on the inside. Change the inside, not just the outside. Well, the problem today is the same thing. There are a lot of people that call themselves Christian, but do they have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life? Have they, have they allowed Jesus to change their heart? Or are they just Christians in name only? That's what that's what that's the question they need to answer. I, I don't need to answer it for them. You don't need to answer it for them. You need to answer it for you, and I need to answer it for me. Are we really following Jesus or are we just pretending? Pretenders have a reservation in the lake of fire. I don't want I don't want a condo there. But tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. He relents from sending disaster. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. Tear your hearts. Actually, <laughs> actually repent, people. Turn to God. And receive his grace and his compassion because he is gracious. <coughs> the word grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Giving us something we don't deserve. Gracious and compassionate. We see God as being this grumpy God who has a quick temper. God's not like that. God's not like that. He's slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. You know, America, to be honest with you, has deserved judgment from God for a very long time. I mean, things have just ratcheted up to where you know we're living in Sodom and Gomorrah right now but how patient has God been and he's been patient he says not wanting any to perish but all to come to repentance that's why he hasn't come back yet that's why he hasn't said okay everybody out of the pool because there are some people that when that trumpet sounds, they aren't going to go to be with Jesus. Are, are you one of them? If you are, what God's waiting for is you. He's waiting for you to surrender your life to Jesus. So that when you step into eternity, like, like Sissy did, and like my friend Terry did, that you will hear those words, well done good and faithful servant. That's what God wants. Will you stand before the judgment seat of Christ or will you be one of those, uh, let's see, Don, Don, Don. I'm not seeing a reservation here. I want your name to be in the book of life. I don't want you setting up a condo on the lake of fire. I've heard that the heaven is spectacular. And I have two friends that are looking at it right now. 
They're looking at it right now. and They're healthy. Terry had, had heart problems I didn't even know. And Sissy, we all know, had cancer. They don't have those things anymore. They're completely healed. And they're doing the things that they enjoy. I want you to be there one day. And I want to be there. I'm going to be there one day. I want you to go with me. Evelyn's going to be there one day. She's thinking, yeah, but I hope I live a long way from Don. I put up with him for a, a lifetime. <laughs> but you see, we're all going to stand before God one day. We all will. And judgment for the non-believers is going to be terrible. It's going to be worse than this story of Egypt. And by the way, this story is going to get worse next week. Judgment for the believer, though, is going to be receiving rewards. So let's turn to Jesus today before it's too late. Not to just avoid judgment but to have a full life in Jesus Christ. And if you have not turned your life over to him, I'm going to give you that opportunity right after we pray. And speaking of prayer, let's pray right now. Father, I do thank you that you have put plenty of warnings in the Bible warning us that, that it would be better for us to follow you and do the things that you put on our hearts to do instead of rejecting that. Lord, I, I, you, you make it clear, and I thank you for that, because, you know, we, we, we know what we don't want to do, and we know what we need to do. And Lord, we're all going to stand before you. So those people that say, always lead to God. They're sort of right because we're all going to stand before you, but some people are going to go into eternal glory and that's the people that have surrendered their lives to you. We don't want to be those other people. We want our names written in the book of life. So Lord, convict our hearts. Show each and every one that's watching today where we stand with you. And if we need to make changes, help us to do that. Now, with everybody's heads bowed and with your eyes closed, especially if there's people in the room where you're watching, if you're one of those people that says, you know what, I, I might end up standing up there and they look in the book and my name's not there. And then what will I do? Well, I'll tell you what to do. Do it right now. If you're one of those that, that, and you think your name's not in the book, I'd like to pray with you right now a prayer of salvation. If you'd like to do that, would you simply lift your hand up and put it back down? I know it seems silly because I can't see you. You know who can? God. Jesus can see you right now. And he sees more than your hand go up. He sees your heart. So right now, if there's anybody that would like to get their life right, that you'd like to get your name written in the book of life. Anybody else before we pray? All right, now I want everybody to say this prayer together so that that one who lifted their hand, you know, will feel comfortable praying right along. And this, these aren't magic words. If you don't agree with these words, don't say them. But you know, for you, for you and I that are believers, um, it, it's okay to pray it over and over and over again. So let's 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 pray that prayer of salvation, Father. Father, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for sending your Son to die for all of us. To die for all of us, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the cross. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sin. I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sin. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my life. And I will follow you. And I will follow you. As your Holy Spirit helps me. As your Holy Spirit helps me. 
for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. And baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And baptize me with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 Well, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. And you got your reservation. Now what I want you to do is make sure that uh, you, you need to start on finding out what God actually says to us. So read the Bible, fellowship with other Christians. You're kind of doing that now. This whole pandemic has made that awkward, but we will start meeting together again. But start getting together with other believers and, and learn what the Christian life is all about. But welcome, 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 and well done. God bless you all. We'll see you on Sunday.